Charlie Corn was a hero bold of noble enterprise. For if you do but taste his blood, it will make your courage rise. It will make a man forget his woe. It will heighten all his joy. It will make a widow's heart to sing. Though the tear were in her eye. Then let us. It talks of the land of its birth and the people who created it with every smell, every sip. It's all about people and the passion that people have for um, producing their particular malt or, or blended whiskey. It's a bigger way of looking at it, about this kind of distillation of Scotland in a glass. You know, for its people, it kind of comes back to the people. When they start talking about malt whiskey, you know, you get, you get to a piece of their heart and it's not, you know, it's not like beer and it's not even like wine. Malt whiskey takes them to a special place. You know, it has a special place for them. And it is all about, at the end of it, this mystical and magical idea of where it comes from. The origins of whisky, uh, as my good friend Dr. Morgan says, are obscure. Nobody knows who made the first whisky in Scotland. Whisky started in Scotland with magic, okay? Because one of the few things we know um, about the very early history of distilling is that distilling was brought to the country by early Christian monks, missionaries, probably came from Ireland, Colonsay, Isla, then maybe onto the mainland. And monks knew about distilling because distilling was science. It wasn't distilling, it was science, okay? So most distilling was carried on in monastic institutions until they were abolished during the Reformation. Yeah, secret stuff. Many of the people who were involved with this distilling were not distilling to produce whiskey. I mean, they produced something called aquavit which people have managed to persuade themselves somehow goes through this aquavit, aquavite, oscabar, oski, whiskey, linguistic, um, you know, nonsense, uh, in my view. Um, what they were doing, what many of them were doing, was forging at the lines between magic and science. And believe me, in the 14th and 15th century, the dividing line between magic and science was very, very thinly drawn. The first written reference is uh, in 1494, in an exchequer rule, which is a bit like a sort of royal grocery list. Uh, eight bowls of malt wherewith to make aqua vitae um, from King James IV, the great Renaissance king of Scots. But what it was being made for is not, not clear at all. King James was very interested in gunpowder, for example, and it's possible that the that they used spirits, they used to, it was called corning, they, the gunpowder would make a bigger bang if it was, if it was sort of, it was ground up into little granules rather than, than fine powder. Um, and they used to grind it up into these granules, um, corned powder as it was called, using water. But if you, if you used a volatile um, spirit, um, it, would, it would give an even bigger bang. Very difficult to do because it was, it was, it was volatile. So he might have used it for that. He was known to be passionately interested in alchemy, as was were all scholars of, of, that, of that period. Uh, the transmutation of, of um, base metals into gold and the transmutation of other substances into, so the, for taking base elements like water and barley or beer and distilling it, making it, giving it a sort of quintessence. And so his interest in, in aqua vitae and distilling may have arisen from, uh, for all these reasons, rather than 
specifically as, um, as a bevy. Whiskey as we know it really only began to, to take form in the 19th century. The whiskey that was made before then would have been made by crofters, made in small stills. Uh, it'd probably been quite heavily peated. It probably wouldn't have been all that well distilled. This seems sacrilegious to say so, but you know, if I'd given, if I gave anybody a glass of uh, 18th or 17th century whiskey today, they'd probably, oh Jesus, you know, that's dreadful. An important part of, of kind of whiskey evolving was post 1745. There's a band putting on distilling from small stills. Part of it, partly, was actually driven by the rampant alcoholism in London, where people were drinking gin like it was water. Uh, so it was actually to try and stop gin production in London as much as it was to, to try and stop whiskey production in the Highlands. But the effect in the Highlands uh, was kind of catastrophic. The crofters farming the poor lands in, in southern Speyside, for example, grew a poor quality barley. The barley wouldn't fetch as much money at market as stuff from more fertile. What do you do with it? You know, do you just accept less money? No, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll make whiskey out of it. We'll make actually more money. And that was the way they kept their crops going. It was a nice bit of money that kind of guaranteed income that would be coming in every year. All of a sudden it was made illegal. So this whole thing of smuggling began to evolve. Whiskey would have been smuggled from the time it was taxed. It was first taxed in 1644, particularly after the Union of the Parliaments in 1707, where it became a, a, a political statement in some circles as well. To, it was, it was a, 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 an, a, an embodiment of the independence of um, the people of Scotland against this foreign taxing body. The, the, the excise board was sat in London and was manned in Scotland mainly by, by English people. Um, and so for those who were of... Um, a patriotic bent of mind, or a Jacobite later on, a Jacobite bent, smuggling was, was like a matter of, of honour, really. The industry was forced underground in years of taxation, bad, bad government, and uh, it was forced underground. And they, they, that time, I always say, they, they found the right places to distill, they found the remote glen with the, the, the best water supply. Maybe they took the barley and they would have to hide that. And, they used to have to smuggle their copper pot stills from Keith up to the smugglers under the eyes of the excisemen round about here because we were watching what was going on. Round about the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, there were customs and excise officials and soldiers being sent into this part of, of Scotland, the Speyside area and up in the Glenlivet area, to try and find illegal distills or a store of illegally produced whisky. But, um, the, 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 the people who were distilling at that time were quite crafty and they had those things fairly well concealed in caves and uh, in woods and so on. So it was rather difficult for the excisemen to find anything. And they hit on what they thought was a brilliant idea. If we offer a reward for information leading to the discovery of a, a still or, or an illicit cache of whiskey, uh, they might have some more success. Um, but this backfired on them because what would happen is the little stills that the uh, farmers, distillers were using would become worn out with use and they would have to replace them. So they would get a friend to go to the local exciseman and tell him where he could find this worn out still, collect the reward money, give it back to his friend, probably got a few shillings for his trouble, and his friend would go round to his local coppersmith, have a nice new still made, and within two or three weeks he was back in production again. I like the idea of these guys sort of rampaging through the back roads of the Highlands uh, with ponies and kind of, you know, evading uh, gaugers and troops and, you know, it kind of it appealed to my, you know, anarchic side of my nature, perhaps. So the Scots always believe it's a right to have whisky. Yeah. Robert Burns wrote that Freedom and Whisky Gang together. Scotland, my old respected mother, though whilst you moistify your leather, Till where you sit on craps o' heather, ye tenure dam. Freedom and whiskey, gang together, tack off your dram. That was in the great poem, An Author's Earnest Cry and Prayer to the Scotch Members of Parliament. And that's a, a, a long polemic against the, the, the banning of private distilling and, um, and, and weaving in all sorts of, of, of patriotic um, sentiment and directed it to, to the Scotch members of parliament and saying, look, you should be standing out, you should be speaking out against this, um, this measure.
Well, Robbie Burns certainly en enjoyed a drama too in his day, that's for sure. And of course, he was a, a customs and excise officer for a while, poacher turned uh, gamekeeper. And especially given his A, Republican, and B, his patriotism, and his, in, in, in many of his poems, he despises the cursed horse leeches of the excise, do you know? He's very vocal against the excise, um, battening on the poor people and so on. And so why did he seek employment as an excise man? Um, well, the answer was that, that the poor fellow was, was you know, so, so desperately poor and so broken in health by farming these, these uh, appalling little farms that with bad luck, really, that it was a way of, of achieving some sort of income. The history of Scotch whisky has been littered with references to tax. The first record we have of distilling in Scotland was in 1494, and it was in the tax records of the time. So throughout the written history of Scotch, we've had the written history of taxation of Scotch as well. But by 1823, the whole thing had got out of control because it was reckoned in Scotland to be about approximately 14,000 illicit distilleries operating. It was getting really well organized. It was, it was brutal. You know, there were, there were, people were killed and beaten and so on. And, um, and it had become a, a serious problem. And at that stage, the, the landed gentry, who previously had sort of, I mean, they, they, they were also the magistrates, and so smugglers would come up and they would give them nominal fines or they would, um, you know, because it was in their interest, because if the guy who was maybe their own tenant um, could make money on the side selling whiskey, then he could pay a higher rent or at least pay his rent um, on time, you know. So it was really in the interest of the, of the gentry to, to, cut, to turn a blind eye to, to, to smuggling. There was a very celebrated visit by King George IV to Edinburgh in 1822, and this was well recorded in the press of the day. And he actually asked for Glenlivet whiskey, knowing full well that it had been made illegally, but Glenlivet whiskey, the whiskey from that area, was considered to be the very finest that you could get at that time. The fact that the king asked for it was a huge embarrassment to the government of the day, um, so a royal commission was set up under the chairmanship of the Duke of Gorton, who at that time own, owned all of the land in the Glenlivet area. And new laws were introduced in 1823, uh, which reduced the license fee. And, uh, and the penalties for smuggling correspondingly were raised. And so it became in the interests of these people who were farmers and distillers to become distillers and farmers. And that was in the 1823 Act, which is a milestone act in the history of Scotch. And from that dates the modern industry. And you see what I'm saying? The, it's weaving its way right through the, the fabric of Scottish history. It's part of the, the psyche of Scotland. So the key to the Scotch whisky industry is Scotland itself. 256 miles long by 147 miles wide. It has a coastline of 5,006.6 nautical miles, 30,166 square miles, 721 islands, but 900 billion litres of rain fall on it every year. So come on a holiday and enjoy yourself. So in the southern part of the country, in the lowlands, very soft, green, gentle rolling hills, and the whiskies there are soft and delicately flavoured, so they take on some of the characteristics of the area where they're produced. Then you come north of that into the larger area, the highlands, um, much more rugged territory, and so the whiskies from the highland distilleries, a bit more robust, and they all have um, a fruity and a, and a spicy character to them. Uh, within the highland area, you have this area where we are now in Speyside, this is where approximately half of all the malt whisky distilleries are located. And they have similar characteristics to the Highlands, but also they have a nice floral and fragrant character to them. The thing about Scotch whisky is you stick your nose in the glass and the play, it comes, comes to life. You shut your eyes and you can actually picture yourself somewhere. You can picture yourself on a hill. It sounds ridiculous, but you picture yourself on a hill or walking along the beach. You know, it, it's just got this wonderful evocation of the place where it's made. Some whiskies are positively a reek of it. And then over on the west coast you have the islands, the island of Isla in particular, and this is where the most intensively flavoured whiskies come from. And a feature of all of the Isla whiskies is they have this smoky, peaty, medicinal seaweed character to them. It's interesting to think, well, you know, how do they get in there? Is it just a matter of, well, the distillery is there and all these flavours just kind of float in? I think it's a bit more complex than that. 
we understand a great deal of what goes into making Scotch whisky. But you know, if you were to build a new distillery today, you don't know until five, eight, ten years down the line what that whisky is really going to uh, mature into and how it's going to taste. And you have instances where um, one distillery has been built next to another one, but it produces a, a different flavor, a different character. So I think there are, in many ways, a microclimate around distilleries that has an influence on what the final flavor is going to be. Only Scotland can make Scotch whiskey. You know, so it's nice that some of it is, is still a bit uh, mysterious. Uh, I like that. What Scotch whiskey is, is actually enshrined in statute. So, as you know, it has to be made from uh, malted barley and other grains. Um, it has to be made in Scotland. It has to be matured for three years in Scotland in oak casks. It cannot be sold at less than 40% alcohol by volume. So you've, what makes Scotch whisky different? Partly it's all of that stuff, but that's actually just a framework. The recipe is very, very simple. Malted barley, water and yeast. But each distillery does it in a slightly different way. And that's the great thing about, about whisky, is that each distillery operating in Scotland uses roughly the same kit. You know, they all have the same equipment in their distilleries. They're all running roughly the same operation. They all mash, they all ferment, they all distill, they all age in wood. So you would think, ergo, every whisky's going to taste the same, and it doesn't. Um, distilleries are strange creatures. And um, we've had instances in the past, I was speaking to someone about this the other day, where we've maybe closed a distillery for a couple of years uh, and then we've wanted to reopen it. And so you get guys who know, how, know a lot about distilling and they go in and they sort of switch everything on and all the bits and pieces look the same, but then they say, how does this place work? Because there's a mystery. So that sounds like romantic twaddle, but it's not, believe me. There is a mystery, and it's not science, it's an art, about how each distillery actually works. Forget about cognac, forget about rum, forget about tequila, forget about bourbon, forget about armagnac. It's scotch whisky. That is the most complex drink that you'll ever come across. And it's because of these artisans and technicians and, and, and craftsmen who, who, are, who are working in distilleries, that's what makes the difference. Um, and they're producing these highly idiosyncratic products uh, very often made by very idiosyncratic people as well, it has to be said in quite an uncompromising way. There's no substitute for the man that's on the job, like it's, it's doing it like, and com try and computerise that thing, but to me it's not the way forward, like uh, for whisky. Like. If we take the whisky making process, what are the essential ingredients? If you read the whisky books, you'll get the, the, the idea that it's the water. And this is a concept that's been spread around the world. Well, of course, water is important, but what you also need is good barley. And Scotland probably produces more barley per acre than any other country in the world. Well, it's not too bad. Eh? It's been grown for molten, like, so it should be pretty good this year. First and foremost, all the malt, or the barley, as it is originally, of course, is grown on the east coast of both Scotland and England because the climate is generally recognised as being much drier there. Lots of different varieties of malt, or bar malted barleys, are experimented in the lab every year to the extent that possibly only three, four or five are actually passed by the Institute of Brewing. In other words, to be fit enough to be used within the brewing and distilling industries in the UK. Well, the malting process is an important part of uh, the whisky making process because the barley, the, the barley corn, because of the Scottish climate, makes it so hard that we can't extract the sugar simply. We're aiming to turn barley into a raw material that's useful for the distiller. What we do is mimic really the natural process of the grain growing into next year's plant. We simply soak it in water to trigger off spring growth. We allow it a little heat and as it starts to grow we turn it to give it oxygen and to stop it marting together. It's just a simple process of getting sugar. The French are lucky, they just squeeze a the grape, they have sugar. But in Scotland to get our sugar we take the barley corn, steep it and malt it. If someone could 
write their name on their malt shield shovel with the, the softened grain, then that was a pretty good indication that it was right. We arrest the growth at that stage. We lay the grain out on a perforated floor and push blow very large volumes of hot air through. And it's at this stage um, that we have the opportunity to add repeat smoke. This is what we call the peat cutter. The idea of the peat cutter with a finger on this side is for it to cut the peats at the wood you want. For making whiskey on Isla, here is the top peat is the peat we really want. On the peat, you see there is the fibres and stuff. We want it so it does not burn quick. The second peat down here burns very quick, burns like coal. This is the top peat here, what I'm dropping onto the ground. And this here is the black peat. As you see the difference in the quality, the black peat is very light coal and it burns very for heat, not for smoke. What you'll find in here is that the, most of the equipment we have is original. Uh, this is the, the mill which was built in 1881. All this equipment, wooden elevators, etc. Uh, we've renovated it all, we, try, we have it working daily and you'll find the same thing as we go through the, the rest of the plant. Um, the mash tun was built in 1881, the tanks likewise. Um, and we try and keep it simple, traditional methods. The malt that we bring in, the malted barley, comes in, it comes along this elevator here and drops into the dresser which cleans up the, the grain, takes the dust off and then it goes downstairs into the mill house where the grinding process starts. The grain is crushed up, it goes through, once it's through the mill it's called grist. The grist is then transported through this auger into the elevator here, upstairs and across to the mash house ready for mashing. And as I said already the mashing process uh, basically is, is mixing water with the grist. In Scotland we have very good water. Uh, it is soft water, and, and that soft water is crucial. It, it flows over granite, as opposed to chalk. Um, uh, a chalky water is hard, so we need soft, good water. Every distillery in Scotland has soft, good water. It may surprise some people just how much water is actually used in a distillery in a week and mainly, or most of it, is used, actually used for cooling purposes. Some distilleries, uh, the bigger distilleries, malt distilleries in, in, in Scotland, will use upwards of about 3 million litres of water per week. So obviously we're very dependent on rainfall in that instance. This is the mash house we're in now. Um, so if you remember, the grist that we brought across from the mill house comes into this bin here. From there it's transferred through the mashing machine and into the mash tun, which is this cast iron tank here. At the same time we add hot water through the side and it comes in mixed up like porridge. So really the, the, the process here is like a, a porridge making exercise up to this stage. So basically what we're doing is we're drawing off uh, sugars and starches from the grist. Uh, we're drawing the water through the grist and we're pumping it, cooling it and pumping it through to the turn room. We try and keep it simple, you know, use one valve where you can instead of two, etc. Um, the nearest thing we have to a computer is this board on the wall here which works with a series of pulleys and strings down through the tank. A wooden block inside the tank floats up and down, therefore the pointer that comes down in the board tells the mashman how many inches there are in the tank, therefore he knows how many gallons there are to the inch. Um, and you don't need technicians to fix it if it breaks down. This is a tun room now and uh, the two waters that came through from the mash tun 
have been pumped in here. The yeast has been added. Uh, once we've pumped the second water, we then declare the wash back, i.e. we, we write, uh, record how much um, wash we've collected. And that's done with a dipstick, which is a dry dip. So we put the dipstick into the wash back um, and basically we take the dry dip of the wash back. And uh, that's it. We should have roughly 36,000 litres. Fully fermented wash in the past was given the name Joe. Um, this was actually drunk in quite uh, abundant amounts. Uh, I can remember hearing a story once that the distillery manager was so fed up about the amount of Joe that was being drunk at his distillery that uh, he took the point of hiding any receptacle that might have been on site, uh, any uh, mug, cup, jam jar, any, any paint pot, anything at all that could hold liquid. So you can imagine the, the shock that the, the men got when they, they came in the next morning and there was nothing for them to drink out of. Uh, lots of bad moods. And one person in particular took uh, great umbrage to this. He stomped about all morning, all day. But suddenly, in the afternoon, he was much better, much more perky. And it became obvious that he'd managed to get a, a hit from somewhere. Uh, nobody could quite work it out. But two weeks later or so, uh, the truth was revealed that he had been so desperate that he'd removed his boot, tied rope round it, lowered it into the wash bag and drank the contents. I mean, one can only uh, uh, revel at the desperation of that. That's true. <laughs>
very few new casts are made because when this all began, roughly about 200 years ago, this is maybe when distilleries were established, before then they made whiskey and they drank it as they made it. But when it had to mature in a barrel, the first sources of casts they used were sherry. Whiskey, as you probably know, is never filled into new casts, it's always into second-hand wood, so we, we feed off the, the wine and the sherry industry, we've filled rum casts, we've filled port casts, we've even filled Chateau Chem casks, so there's, there's quite a variety. We use a barrel maybe four or five times in a, a period of, of maybe over 60 years, so this is why we need coopers, because every time barrels get emptied, they have to be checked for any defect. It removes the bad wood, good parts to replace, they cannibalize, they just take parts from other barrels. And he has to make it fit into the barrel. So this might entail him using the old traditional tools, tools which may have been used for centuries. And it's only recently that wood has even been explored. A few years back, it was, you know, if it came from a tree, we'd chuck whiskey into it. These days, everybody is kind of a bit more, you know, we will only use old harvested from north, north facing slopes of the Ozark Mountains. That's good, you know, that shows attention to detail. The time that the cask is stored is really down to the, the spirit that you want or the whiskey that you want at the end of the day. Our youngest spirit at the moment is 10 years, so obviously the cask we're filling at the moment will remain in the warehouse for a minimum of 10 years. Um, thereafter it depends, we have a 15 year old, we have a 17 year old and so on. The impact that wood has and the way that wood then marries with the spirit and everything comes together, uh, everything interacts in the barrel, in, in, in the darkness to produce this liquid where the colour comes from, where a lot of the aromas come from, where a lot of the flavours come from. It's this marriage of, of wood and whisky and spirit. Unfortunately, uh, we have to put up with a, a, a known expression as the angel shear, where we lose 2% per annum to the angels. Uh, the chemistry of the casks holds the liquid in, but it lets it breathe. So you're losing so much whisky in evaporation. So with all the distilleries in this area, the air outside here is 5% alcohol. <laughs> you could find healthy air. I think that if we look at um, whiskies, um, and we're talking about the Scotch whisky industry, so we've got to talk about uh, blended whiskies and malt whiskies. Um, if we go back and look at the, the history of, 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 of blends and the history of malts, now one of the giants of the blended whiskies is Andrew Usher. What Andrew Usher did in about, I think it was 1863, was to improve what he called the drinkability. And he wanted to improve the variability. So he took some grain whiskey and he blended it. If it hadn't been for the rise of blended scotch in the 19th century, we wouldn't have malt whiskey today as we understand it. Um, because in the 1820s, 1830s, malt whiskey industry as we know it was just being established, distilleries were just being licensed, production was sort of almost pre-industrial, uh, quality control was very poor, uh, the product was very um, low grade, to be absolutely honest, um, and by and large people didn't drink it. So consumption of malt whiskey was very, very limited really to the areas that it was made in. And the, and the thing that changed that and transformed malt whiskey distilling was the rise of blended scotch. Blended scotch whiskey conquered the world as blended whiskey. It produced consistency layer flavours and styles that the customers recognised. But as time went along, um, blenders began to discern different styles 
um, from not only from different parts of the country, but uh, from, from different uh, distilleries. So let's just remind ourselves once again of the four distilling areas of Scotland. Below that Highland line, we have the Lowland Malts. Light, charming, elegant, but more feminine in character. Then we go up to the Highland region. Remember I said to you, that huge area that needs extra maturation. Heavy in body, but you can get the softer, sophisticated, but whiskies with finesse and elegance coming from the Speyside Valley. Look out for these particular ones. Then we come down to Campbellton, very complex, influenced by the sea, that sort of saltiness coming through. And then finally over to Isla, heavy, but bodied, phenolics, full, rich, fiery, peppery in every shape or form. Each area will make their own contribution to the final blend. Now the whole concept of the blender, which is regarded as the most sophisticated person in our industry, the blender is about blending and blended is about blending whiskies. I'm going to make up a blend. I've already added the lowlands and the highlands. Now what I want to do is add a little finesse from the Speyside Valley. Just a few great distilleries from the Speyside region, okay? Blending, of course, um, it's, it's like painting a picture, uh, depending on the whiskies that you select and, and, and the proportions that you mix them in, you can create a whole range of different flavours for blended whiskies. Okay, that's giving me the style that I'm looking for. Now I'm going to add some of these robust characters from these great individual distilleries that are found on the island of Isla. Off it. Just a small amount. A little bit from here. Okay, let's just see. Let's just see that we have not dominated it. And how does the blender bringing 30, 40, 50 different individual whiskies create the blend? Create the blend not just once, but over time, so that if that's your favourite drink, it will be consistent bottling after bottling. The library of knowledge or aromas that the blender must have is a great art and a skill that people need to recognise and appreciate when they're drinking blended whisky. Good. Good. Okay. We've got the Lowlands, the Highlands, the Campbelltons and the Islas that have been mixed there together. So we've created what we call a vatted malt. Now this is no longer a single malt. By adding 35, 40 different component parts, this has become a, a vatted malt, sometimes said as a pure malt. It's a vatted malt. And what is it? It's in a bad mood. It's hot, it's fiery, it's aggressive. Let's add, finally, our grain whiskies. These grain whiskies are light, they're elegant, they're refined, they're, again, not less than three years old. They will help to seduce and take out the hotness, the sharpness of the heavy style malts, particularly from Isla. So we've taken the blend up to approximately 35% malt to 65% green. Let's see how we got on. And you can make a new product anytime you like because of the blending. It's infinite. The, 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 the whiskies you can produce. That's much better. But it's still a little bit hot, it's still a little bit fiery, it's still a bit bad tempered. So what we need to do now is just transfer the blend into wood. Remember, this is what softens, this is what nurtures, this is what brings the final union together. It remains there for two or three months before it is finally bottled. Without Andrew Usher's um, uh, uh, idea that we should blend, then I think the Scotch whisky industry would be as small as the port or the sherry market today. But what's happened over the past 20 years and what excites me most is what's happened with single malt scotch. And malt whiskies were really ignored until well the 1960s when Glenfiddich appeared and, you know, and if it wasn't for Glenfiddich where would we be as far as malt whisky uh, goes. The growth of single malt whiskies in recent years has been you know really quite spectacular. It still accounts for a tiny amount of the overall whisky which is sold but it's increasingly, uh, the, the actual the value of the sales is increasing at a, a very satisfactory level. But 95% of all whiskey sold throughout the world is still blended whiskey. But I think uh, everybody has to recognise that there is a demand for single malt. And I think one of the things that engages single malt drinkers more than anything else 
is that they're not made in factories. They're made in tiny places like the one that we're in, supporting small communities, many of whom have either worked at the past or work now or have family that work in these distilleries. Single malt whiskies are in, enjoying a revival at the moment because people are much better educated about malt whisky in general and therefore the market's improving all over the world. We have a bit of a drill here at the Society and it's much the same if you're tasting any kind of whisky and it's a good thing to look at the whisky, to nose it and to taste it. A great amount of the enjoyment from whisky is actually from the nosing, although it would be hard pressed to sit with a table of folks around the table and teach them that they're just going to smell whisky. But what we do is we have these special glasses and that's so that we can open up the aromas that are in this whisky. So the first thing we do is we pick up the glass and we have a look at the colour of the whisky. And this one's a beautiful pale golden colour which um, gives us a few clues as to what kind of cask it's been stored in. We can see the, the legs, which are the dribbles that come down the side of the glass. That indicates that it's good and high in alcohol, which we like. And the shape of the glass helps to funnel these aromas up to the top of it. And you can just go in and have a wee nose and there's lots of really lovely aromas in there. Um, what we do here is then have a wee taste of it and um, I'll do that now, so I'll be quiet. And what we do is have a really good sip of that, coat the whole of your mouth, try and get the whiskey all around your mouth so that you're hitting the front and back. And quite strong stuff this. This is cask strength, so we're going to probably pop some water in that. If you take a single malt whiskey, okay, at normal strength, so that's going to be about 43% alcohol by volume, you can drink it without water. And in many countries around the world, there are people who will almost attack you if you try and suggest that you should put water in it because they believe it to be a crime and they believe that every rugged, hairy, ugly Scotsman that drinks malt whisky, you know, always drinks it neat, slange of ours, straight down the throat. I used to just get the whisky and I would knock it back and I would hope for another. And this was treated with great horror uh, in, in the north. And of course, um, I was told you had to put water in it. Now I know the science, and that is quite sound. You put some water in your whiskey because it drives the flavor off. And when that flavor is driven off, if you want to tell the quality of a whiskey, it's on the nose. And you won't get the nose unless you put some water in it because the, the flavor components are in the whiskey, and unless you push them off with a little water, you cannot pick up the great effort that is put into the product through the distillation and the maturation without a little water. What about ice? Well, what about it? Simply, you don't need it. But if you do need it, if you do need it, if you put it in, one, two, on the rocks, What's happened? It's anaesthetized it. It's chilled it. It's bruised it. It's masked it. It's held the flavor back. And when you come to taste it, the ice hits your lips. But if you like it, that's entirely up to you. Sometimes I will use ice, but or maybe only maximum two ice cubes. That is because in hotel bars particularly, often whiskies are under quite strong lights on the back bar, and the whiskey gets warm. So rather than put some water into it, I'll put a couple of ice cubes just to chill it a little bit. Uh, I don't want to make it too cold, but just, just to cool it down a little bit. Let the ice melt and, and drink it that way. Forget all these rules about you should only drink whiskey neat or you should only drink whiskey with a splash of water. If you want to drink it with Iron Brew or Coca-Cola, drink it. It's what you like that matters. It's what flavour appeals to you that matters at the end of the day. It's the fact that you're drinking whiskey and enjoying the experience. That's the bottom line as far as I'm concerned. One of the things in the industry we've learnt is that we say drink it with water because that's the elitist way of doing it. But what we've had to learn over the last few years is that if somebody in Spain wants to put Coca-Cola in it, then it's his whiskey. <laughs> and therefore he can put whatever he likes in it. 
It's a slant on, on island life if you produce a dram that's too small. Um, the tradition is you must give a, a reasonable, sensible dram to someone. Now, reasonable and sensible varies quite a lot from a thimbleful to a tumblerful. Uh, and I remember on one occasion, uh, three of us standing round and being offered a dram by this guy. And uh, the dram was small, to say the least. And one of the, the, one of the three guys that got the dram said, uh, there's a fly landed in my dram. And his mate said, oh, don't worry, he'll be safe enough, he won't drown, he's got his feet in the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> the old story at Glen Grant was you could leave your pay packet on the, the table, but you couldn't leave your free dram. The dram would be gone, but the, your pay packet would still be there. Yeah. That, that probably epitomises the honesty of the Scot. Yeah. You know, it stops at whis uh, whisky, it's fair game, it's open season. Ah, whiskey galore, yes, well, um, I wasn't around when uh, the SS politician ran aground in Eriskay. <laughs> but it must have been a wonderful sight, you know, to, to see the, the islanders go down there and go out in their boats and recover particularly the whiskey uh, from the, the politician because she was loaded with, with whiskey for the American market and foundered on rocks uh, off Eriskay and that led Compton Mackenzie to write his famous book on, on uh, whiskey galore. She had something like 20,000 cases of whiskey amongst a mixed cargo and she founded um, off Eriskay. The, the local people managed to, to she, she didn't sink, but um, she, she struck the rocks uh, within a short boat ride from the shore. This young fella, he told us that there was a big ship out there and uh, we went out just to see, oh, the whole island was there, you know. And a lot of excitement, you know. She, oh, she was high, she, just like being in dry dock, she was just on top of the rock, you know. And the local people, I think, rescued the, the, the crew and then discovered what was, in the, what was in the hold. Well, nobody really knew what was on her. Till, uh, as I said, we went aboard her in this fishing boat. My father had the St. Winifred, we went alongside her. And um, there was a wee boat there from Loch Boystil. There was three men on her. And um, they, they invited the Eriskay men to join the party. But at that time, we didn't know what the party was about. Till we clambered up. We were told not to, but we did. We clambered up. Oh, what a sight. You're looking down the hole. They were all sitting down there, the old fellas. And tilly lamps lit, you know, and all that. And, I don't know if they were having a dram, but I know there was plenty there. And by the time the military and the police authorities, um, as they did, they arrived pretty quickly to, to, to try and contain this, um, a lot of the whisky had found its way ashore. They took a hell of a lot of whisky off that ship. I don't know how much, I can't tell you, but it was quite considerable. Yeah. Yeah. I used to sail when I, was a, when I was a boy with my father and we came into Eriskay um, one day and we went ashore in this remote little bay and we met this old boy and uh, we were asking him where we could, where we could fill our, our jerry cans with, with, with water and um, he was a very taciturn man, very sort of unforthcoming and uh, my father said to him, where was it? He said, it'll be about over there that the politician went down. Aye, he said, it was about over there, these wee rocks. There was a pause. And my father said, um, you'll have been all right for whiskey for a week or two after that. And suddenly his face just lit up. He says, we were all right for whiskey for a year or two. <laughs> this old fellow was going to confession and this other guy's coming down. And he says, where were you? He says, I was uh, in church. He had confession, yes. Was a new priest. Did you see the priest? Yes. A new fella. Yes. Uh, what's he like? Oh, Christ, a great fellow, he said. Oh, what do you mean? You bet you never told him how many bottles of whiskey you pinched off the poly. Oh, I did, he says. What did he say? He says it wasn't a sin, he says. It would have been a hell of a sin if I didn't. <laughs> so, I don't know 
<laughs> I don't know if that was true or not, you know. The more whiskies we have, the more the more wider the story gets, the larger it gets. So uh, uh, it may it may be loosen the tongue, but I think sometimes it adds to the the stories that we tell. Well, I mean, I think uh, after you've had a few drams, my goodness me, you can put the world to rights. Of course, you can't remember a thing the following day. Once you've had three, it seems like just the best idea that you carry on and have some more. And when I die, I would love, um, in, in my coffin, <laughs> to have my favourite whiskies with me. <laughs> that would be my wish. Quite often, Scotch whisky is seen as just a bit of fun, but it's a huge economic earner for the UK and for Scotland. It is the leading indigenous industry for Scotland. We generate somewhere in the region of £2.3 billion worth of exports each year, which makes it one of the UK's top five export earners and one of Europe's top ten export earners. So it is a major contributor to the balance of trade across the whole of Europe and particularly for the UK. 90% of what we sell is overseas. And it does surprise quite a lot of people, but the biggest market in the world at the moment for malt is France. Other big markets would obviously be the UK, Japan, the US and Spain. Spain, for example, is, has the biggest consumption of whisky in the world today. The uh, international appeal of Scotch whisky is demonstrated in many ways. So, for example, in Greece we outsell Uso. In France, we sell more Scotch whisky in a month than cognac sells in a year. Within the United States, more Scotch whisky is sold than bourbon is sold. A lot of people ask me if you can make Scotch in Japan and generally no because for Scotch to be classified as Scotch it has to be made in Scotland. But the Japanese were actually very, very cute in one instance when they built a distillery in many houses around it and they called the village as it was Scotland. Therefore they were able to call their Scotch, Scotch. We learned actually how to make whiskey in this country. One Japanese man came to here nearly 70 eight years ago, then he brought back technology, skill, knowledge, everything to, ja to Japan. As far as I'm led to believe, they did get away with it, yes. We can make Japanese whiskey, nice Japanese whiskey, but unfortunately, we can't make Scotch whiskey. A Scotch whiskey is a unique product in that the production uh, is in, mainly in rural areas. So the Scotch whiskey industry is providing a lot of jobs. I mean, directly employed in the, in the industry and, and indirectly as well. There's something like 45,000 people in Scotland employed. But the number of people in the industry is only part of the story. We get grain from farmers and maltsters. We buy bottles and labels and packaging from companies that produce the goods that we need. And therefore, we sustain something like one in every 50 Scottish jobs. So rural communities like Speyside and Isla, where whisky is produced, Many of these towns exist because the jobs are there. Remember, in Speyside, they say that Rome was built in seven hills and Dufftown was built in seven stills. Being from Speyside, whisky was always there. It was part and parcel. We often say that we're immersed in whisky from an early age. Well, we were brought up in the, in the whisky uh, world. Everybody in the village was connected with whisky. I mean, it was, everybody was employed with the whisky. They've cut peat for years and years. My father and my father's grandfather and his father. Well, this one here was my grandfather's and it was cut for me. I'm afraid he was a wee bit taller than I was. And you see there the horns, he used to cut the horns off the cows and use them for peat cutting, for the peat spades. Nowadays it's a very job to get a horn. My only connection with the whisky industry is that my great uncle was a cooper and he actually built one of the washbacks in the turnroom, which you've seen the name on. Uh, but that was in 1881 when the place was actually built. Whisky's got a very, very good future ahead of it. Uh, the whiskies that are being made today, are, there's a greater range of whiskies than ever before. There's also this incredible interest in the public and because there's interest from the public, 
the distillers have suddenly realised that they're not just selling this kind of anonymous product, which perhaps blended whisky had become, and with malt whisky in particular. Uh, they're selling a story about people because you've got to talk about people when you're talking about whisky. You've got to come to the distillers, you've got to talk to the craftsmen who make it. And that was always missed out because brands don't operate like that. Brands work in a completely different frame. Whereas malt whisky can talk about the hand crafting of things. And that appeals to folk. And that's, to me, that's, that's tremendous because the young son heroes of the whisky trade have been the guys who are out there in the, in the distillery actually working and, and, and doing a tremendous job. They're finally getting the credit, so you're finding instead of uh, brand managers and marketeers going out and talking to the public, you're getting distillery managers or warehousemen or, or whoever going out and talking. It's absolutely tremendous because you're getting, they, you know, these guys shoot from the hip. Is it Sir Walter Scott said those cunning alchemists at Glenlivet referring to the illicit distillers? Yeah, it's definitely alchemy. Bit of black magic here and there. Well, a wee bit magic, eh? You need a luck on your side, like. There's a nice story of the fellow at Linkwood who took over the distillery, and he was so afraid to change anything, he instructed them not to take down any of the cobwebs which had been built up by the spiders. <laughs> so people know that it's, there's a fair amount of magic in there and they don't want to interfere with it too much. At the end of the day, when it comes to really understanding the process, if you get these guys up against a wall, Ultimately, they will shrug their shoulders and go, well, you know, we just don't know. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have liked to see him, Daddy. Like I couldn't have tell you, Daddy. Like. It's entirely up to you. It's like you coming here to my sample room in January. I say hello, how are you? I take your clothes off and put you outside. You're gonna get a fright. It's the same with the whiskey. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> fantastic expression from a distillery manager who said of his product that if one knew how much to drink of it every day, one could live forever. I think that's very much the, what the water of life represents. Mm -hmm.